Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of What Do You Mean You've Never Seen, a podcast that explores and analyzes prestigious and popular films that one of us has never seen before. I'm your host, Jonathan Colon, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-hosts, Jennifer Branch. Hey, everybody. And Max Abelman. Hello, everybody. Joining us this week is our special guest host, James Alexander. James comes to us from Wisconsin. He's calling in. He's our first call-in guest co-host. And he is my and Jennifer's brother. Say hello to the people, James. Hey, everybody. How's it going? We're very excited to have James with us to discuss this week's film, V for Vendetta. So I'm your host, Jay for Jonathan. Uh, That would make me J for Jennifer. And J for James and M for Max. Oh. Yay! Yay! Yay, letters. (laughs) Oh, good. We like letters here. So myself and Jennifer are wa- have watched this movie for the first time for this podcast. And Max and James have both seen it before. All right, let's get right into it. Uh, this film was released in 2005. It is based on a graphic novel. It was directed by James McTeague in his feature directorial debut from a screenplay by the Wachowskis. Yeah. Now known as Lana and... Yeah, the the sisters now. Sisters. Yeah. I forget the other ones. Lana and Yeah. Lo- I don't it's remember not either. But the Wach- remember. they they're credited as the Wachowskis. Yeah. It is based on V for Vendetta by Alan Moore and David Lloyd, produced by Joel Silver and Grant Hill, and starring Natalie Portman, Hugo Weaving, Stephen Ray, Stephen Fry, and John Hurt. I remember when this movie came out because it was like a Wachowski's joint and they were still riding pretty high off of the Matrix series. I was aware of its existence. I knew that it was based on a graphic novel. I knew nothing of the plot before we got into this. I feel like a lot of younger people at the time thought it was super cool. So it was sort of made a big impact at the time because of the people that were involved. I guess the the graphic novel is pretty well regarded within the comic book reader community, which as you all know, I am not one of. But Max, maybe you can talk about the uh, cultural significance of this film. Yeah, I I don't know how much is necessarily quoted from this movie other than like the 5th of November poem and then the V monologue. So it's not something that's necessarily quoted at you all the time. I think the thing that has persevered more than anything is the Guy Fawkes mask, which is still used as a symbol today for anarchy and rebellion and is uh, most recently been used by the hacker anonymous i was gonna say that's the anonymous uses that mask and anonymous does use that mask yeah this was uh this was a very significant film to me as a young adult it was very significant to me as a young gay man it had enough of those themes it wasn't necessarily hitting you over the head with those themes, but it was it was very meaningful to a lot of people. It's a movie that's about strength to overcome, and that resonated with a lot of people of my generation. And uh, just a brief plot description. The story of this film is a dystopian future in London, England. Natalie Portman is a young lady who works for the state-run television station. I think she works for a, for more of a like a late-night comedian, but they, they are the propaganda arm of this fascistic party that has taken over United Kingdom politics. She crosses paths with this mysterious V character who wears the Guy Fox mask. He blows up the uh, court of justice at the very beginning of the movie and then barges his way into the news station and uh, announces that he's going to blow up parliament one year later on the next Guy Fox Day. He and Natalie Portman cross paths multiple times in the movie. She helps him. He rescues her from being taken away by the black bag people. He is on a mission to get revenge on several people who, it turns out later in the movie, high high members of government who were responsible for the plague pandemic that was the instigating incident for this fascistic government to take over. So throughout the film, you you find out who was responsible for what and why. It turns out that they were doing human experimentation on prisoners of the state. They created this virus, they released the virus, and then blamed terrorists for it. And then they created the cure for it and then made a bunch of money. So he kind of picks off these characters one by one, the ones that were in charge of the prison where these experiments took place. Towards the end, he 
has his final showdown with the top dude who's played by John Hurt. All the top people get killed and Parliament blows up and Natalie Portman is now ready to help the resistance or the revolution take place. She goes from being a very passive character to taking an active role and wanting to make change in her society. So there's a lot of stuff in this that's clearly still very prescient today. But let's talk about what we knew about this movie before we watched it. I can speak for myself saying that I had never seen this movie. I had no idea what the plot was. All I knew was Natalie Portman. At some point, she had her head shaved and there was a guy in a Guy Fox mask. And that was about it. How about you, Jennifer? That's more than I knew because I did not know Natalie Portman was in this movie. See, <laughs> I thought I knew Natalie Portman was in this movie. Yeah. But my the picture I ha- had of her was that she was still like a little girl. I think I was confusing uh, this with the one mm. where she was w- with Jean Reno, where we're like when she's like 14, 13. Yeah, yeah, where he like rescues her. Or like, I forget what the name of that movie is. Somebody could look it up. But yeah, I thought that was this movie. <laughs> so yeah. I, didn't I had even no know idea. When, when she shows, I didn't know what year it was released. And, and I purposely didn't look up any information on yeah, it. Yeah, when you just yeah. told me it was 2005, that surprised yeah. me. I thought it was like 2010. Yeah, like, so I didn't the, even know. The I same year that uh, she was also in uh, Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith. Ooh. Came out the same year. Mm. But that's not sand. No, the no. sand is in Sand the, is two. Okay. Sand is, was in 2002. What, that same that for yeah. Pod, yeah, our Star Yeah, it, was, a, it was, I believe the director saw Natalie Portman in Attack of the Clones, and that's what put her on his radar. Was But that. I have a question, though. Yeah. Instead of Natalie Portman doing a fake accent, why didn't they just get Kira Knightley? Mm, I don't know. Aren't they the same? I was probably too busy with those Pirates of the Caribbean <laughs> movies by then. I guess. Probably. I guess so. uh, I'm like, if you wanted British Natalie Portman, why not just get Kira Knightley <laughs> to do it? I don't know. I know Evie is supposed is supposed to be a young character, and even though uh, Natalie Portman is acting her age in this movie, she does seem like she's older, acting like someone who's supposed to be younger, even though she is the age she's supposed to be. Because mm. she looks older than yeah, she, she is. Yeah. So. She looks a bit more well, mature so than does she is. Kira Knightley. <laughs> oh, right, we'll see. Yeah. So uh, we we know that this is a, a favorite movie of Max's. So I'm going to ask is. you this next question first, James. What did you remember about having seen this film before and the plot? And were your recollections accurate? Yeah, I, I remember. Well, when you first told me that this is a movie that I was going to be watching, quote unquote, with you guys. My thoughts were on it were, I remember it coming out. I remember seeing it when it came out. I was a senior in high school. And like you mentioned up top, it was they were riding pretty high on the Matrix train. And so it's like, oh, mm-hmm. it's written by the Wachowskis, Hugo Weaving's in it, who, as we all know, was a big part of the Matrix trilogy and Lord of the Rings and everything. So it sounded like a cool movie. At the time, I was, I'd say, more into comic books than I am now. I honestly, since it's been so long since I've seen this movie, I completely forgot it was a comic until the DC logo showed up at the front of it. I was like, oh, that's right. This is a graphic novel. Like, I remember that there's a massive twist with you know, her being captured and it all wasn't real. It was actually just V pretending to be capturing her and putting her through kind of the similar experience that he went through. I do remember that. I remember the really cool fight scene at the end where he's kind of like fighting really fast and everyone else looks like they're in slow motion. I'm a big, huge fan of action movies and it's just really cool to see some good fight scenes that don't look too choreographed and fake. Mm -hmm. So I I remembered that about this movie, that it has great action. And that's pretty much all I had remembered. It kind of was a little bit of like, oh yeah, I I remember that. Oh yeah, I remember that. So it wasn't definitely not a movie that I can see myself watching over and over again. Right. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, have, it's, it's a great film, and I'm sure we'll give our compliments at the end of this. But it, it is certainly some themes are very difficult to see, especially with us now living through a lot of what's going on in the film, in some cases, dead on what's going on in our in our current state. But mm-hmm. When you, when you think about what life was like 15 years ago, I think this film also does a great job of not putting it too much into the future. It still felt really real, whereas when you watch others like Hunger Games and other dystopian films, they, they tend to be like, okay, I mean, the future really looks like that. And then by the time we, we catch up with that time period, it's like, yeah, see, you were wrong. There's, there's no flying cars. There's no automatic <laughs> yeah. lacing yeah. up boots. Right, uh, right. Back to the future, too, looking at you. Oh. So Entire I, I, food yeah, my, comes my, in pill form. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, no no uh, hydrating pizza in a Pizza Hut machine. You mm, know? Right. Exactly. But, right. um, 
that, that's kind of kind of what I remembered. I didn't I didn't remember much, but I remembered some little flashes here and there. All right, and Max, uh, how many yes. times have you watched this movie? You think? Um, I would say like full viewings, probably eight or nine times. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. did you remember all of this? Yeah, stuff I, yeah, I remembered all of it. Yeah, I re- I always remember record. this movie. Mm-hmm. I will always remember the fifth of November. Um, I usually watch this movie once once a year, not on the fifth of November. I'm not that religious about it, but I I really like this movie and it's very rewatchable to mm. me when you say like I, I again i went in knowing nothing about this so when you say that it was written by the same matrix people i'm like okay that makes a lot of sense given the action scenes and yeah. all that like yeah. it's very matrixy mm-hmm. and however the author of the graphic novel also wrote the graphic novel of league of extraordinary gentlemen he did Ooh, um we should yeah watch that. So uh, I watched the that movie one that in a ended while. Sean Connery's career. I haven't seen that one in a while. We should watch that. <laughs> yeah. See if it holds up. So that is Alan Moore, and he's a very interesting comic book writer. Meaning he's also just a very strange person. He's had three adaptations of his works, three or four adaptations of his works. I think it was From Hell, V for Vendetta, League of Extraordinary, Extraordinary Gentlemen. Gentlemen. And Watchmen. Oh, Watchmen. That, yeah. That checks out. Um, after League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, the movie came out, he just decided, okay, I'm not going to be involved with the recreation of my comic books on screen anymore because he's just always disappointed in them. So he never actually watched V for Vendetta. He read the script for it, was like, uh, no, um, <laughs> this is bad. This is not what I wrote. He thought that the fascism was wasn't fascist enough and he thought the anarchy wasn't anarchistic enough he thought it was more like a an american conservatism versus liberalism Mm -hmm. rather than like full-on fascism and full-on anarchy so he said you know what don't credit me for this don't pay me for this i'm not gonna watch it and stop releasing press statements that say i like it um did they do that uh, yeah that was that was a whole controversy yeah yeah Yeah, warner brothers was yeah you can get oh uh, good old yeah. Warner, good old Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers was releasing statements on his behalf, oh. saying that he liked it, and he did not like it. Huh. Yeah, and then in sometime in the nineties, he stopped writing comics so he could practice ceremonial magic. Oh. That well, classic transition. Yeah, sounds like yeah. fun. Yeah, um, I did. Yeah, forget if you to- look up a Google a picture of Alan Moore, <laughs> pause your yeah. podcast right now and. Google a picture of Alan Moore, and yes, you will believe that this man practices magic in his spare yeah. time. Absolutely. Sure. I did forget to mention <laughs> earlier in our recording the budget and box office for this movie. The budget is listed as 50 to $54 million, and the box office was $132.5 million. So it was successful. Yeah. It wasn't a giant hit. But it, but, made, it made its money. But it definitely made its impact with the all of the... <laughs> The controversy, I'm sure, Mm -hmm. and particularly within the comic books community. All right, we're going to move on to what was it like to watch? So I'm going to ask each of you co-hosts to give me your thoughts and impressions on the film. Was it an interesting watch? And what stood out about it? Uh, We're going to go to our guest host first. So what other thoughts do you have and impressions on the film, James? Yeah, I mean, it it was a great watch for me. I mean, I really wish I could have watched it in one sitting. I did have to kind of split it up just due to some some things that I had going on in my my house. But it's such a, I think even with me splitting it up into multiple watches, it's not one that feels like it's over two hours long. It travels really well from story to story. I mean, I will say, say that Evie could have been out of the movie and it probably would have been the same kind of experience for me. Like I, I still have a tough time like understanding why this character has to exist other than the little backstory where you do find out that her parents were part of the cause and that her brother died from this virus that the government created. Plus it's really distracting when Natalie Portman attempts a British accent for me. I, I just yeah. don't think yeah. it, yeah, especially it when you're surrounding her by all these like fantastic British and Australian actors, which as we all know, Australian people are really good at doing British accents in most right. cases. So that, that, that kind of distracted me from the film. I do think she redeemed herself for me during the parts where she's reaching her wit's end with the torture that she's going through with V. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought Hugo Weaving is amazing in everything that we see. I mean, he could read the newspaper to me and I would still find it fascinating. <laughs> so I, I was very, very pleased to see him in, in this again. I, it's very strange to see John Hurt 
in a villainous role. Like we see him in, in so many like fun little side character wacky things. Like I, I always think of the wand guy from Harry Potter when oh, I think of John Vander, Hurt. So yeah. It, yeah, it's very strange to see him in this totally, utterly evil fascist leader role. And and that's something else that I find interesting about the film is that, you know, as I said, like well, whenever we see dystopian films where we see this horrible thing that has happened to these countries, I always like to think like, is this something that could really happen? You know, is this something that would scare me? And I, I cannot foresee like the UK especially going this kind of route, you know, having gone through World War II because it's in this is in the future but it's not too far in the future where like hey everyone has forgotten about hitler and how he attacked the Uh uk and you know brought them into world war ii and that's really just a big part of the story but i find that part a little bit distracting for me but i think that they handle it well with how governments can do these snarky little things to you know you see it with the virus you see it with how they spin the shot of the person that was wearing the guy fox mask like lying there and like oh yeah we killed the terrorist oh great the the guy being killed by the terrorist it, this news spins it to where he you know died in his sleep peacefully because of a heart attack or something yeah. so yeah. that's that kind of stuff and that that does make you think like what stories are being fed to us what stories are are actually true when they get reported on the news i thought you know i think that's this movie really gets you thinking about those sorts of things what to believe and you know how to fight back when you feel like the government is lying to you i think that that's a very important thing uh, it's an important message for all of us to Mm-hmm. See, so I, that's where I, where I think that this film really ends up being culturally significant. Right, right. And uh, how about you, Jennifer? What are your initial thoughts on this film? I don't think it's going to come as a surprise to anyone that this film is not something I would seek out to watch. Mm-hmm. It's very violent, so that was not my cup of tea. I, I get everything James is saying, but if the question is how did it feel to like sit down and watch it uh not fun for me not Mm -hmm. not pleasant Mm -hmm. yeah it's i think it's definitely not a scenario particularly if you view it through the lens of what our country or what the world has been going through the last couple years it's it's certainly not a comfortable thing to watch no it's not Um, a fun romp of a movie yeah Yeah. i think it's it's (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> I like a good romp. This was not. <laughs> no, it is not. This a is romp. not Brit- Britney Spears driving down the highway in a convertible, like at all. No. Um, what was the name of that? That movie? movie's darker than you think it is. Um, Give it another rewatch. Oh, I've never seen it. We might have to. <laughs> uh, we might have to Crossroads. do it later. Um, yeah, exactly. yeah, it's this is definitely it, it was a bit uncomfortable to watch because there are so many parallels to the unpleasantness that we've all had to live through these last couple of years. And I, I agree that Natalie Portman's character doesn't seem to be super important to the story, at least not important enough that she's given as much screen time as she has. I did not care for the Heath throws her in a dungeon and tortures her to teach her a lesson about fear. It yeah. was very Stockholm syndrome I, I, do not, I didn't was. like that. Yeah. yeah. Like, like and it, it didn't seem like, I mean, I, we don't know, we know very little about his character, but it, it seems like out of character because he was, he was very protective of her. You know, when he, he starts out the movie, they first encounter each other because he rescues her from guys that are trying to rape her. He put her through some bad shit, man. It was horrible. Yeah. He yeah. was dunking her head in the toilet. Uh, I don't understand that. Uh, it, it, it doesn't make her, sense to cold, me. Burning her with the water. Yeah. It was like, terrible. like it's, I, I don't think that torture is necessarily an effective means of empowering someone particularly when it's a man doing it to a woman you know and and a very small woman you know natalie portman is like is like tiny well i felt it's very much it's like a cult tactic right so Mm -hmm. it's like they torture you and then they do one nice thing and then you like fall in love with them again you know and then they're like i'm doing this to teach you a lesson i'm doing this to help you it's they deprive you of sleep they deprive you of food make you go crazy that's it's yeah it's and he does he does basically indoctrinate her into his way of thinking for sure by doing it so yeah to me i found that pretty problematic um, other than yeah. that, like I, I, I was rooting for his character to get re- his revenge, mm-hmm. and so, so it was, it was quite disappointing for me when that turned. Because I, I was like, okay, we're getting ready. It's going to be the point where he's going to come and rescue her from this prison. That's what I yeah. thought. I thought for sure he was coming to help her, and it turned out it was him that was doing it the whole time. I um, it. No, I didn't like that. Yeah, I feel like they were trying to make V as a character from the comics into a sympathetic character, and he's not necessarily 
necessarily supposed to be. He's not necessarily supposed to be, uh, like, a good person. He's, like, a highly traumatized person, which in the comics he has schizophrenia and does terrible things. And he's also, in the comics, he doesn't have any sort of romantic interest in Evie at all. Evie is 16 in the comics, is a 16-year-old sex worker. Well, I still got the impression that she was supposed to be much younger than he was. Yeah. Like, I I mean, we know we'd never see him, but I have to assume he's pushing 50, right? Based on, like, his backstory. Yeah, it really reminded me of the Phantom of the Opera. Very, very very Phantom of the Opera, very Beauty and the Beast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Christine, Mm -hmm. my angel of music. Yeah. So Um, I would have preferred this story without the romantic thing between them yeah. because it's just like that's not realistic for what those two have been through together their relationship with each other that doesn't turn into love now yeah yeah i um, mean and also the the part where she kisses his mask was just very like uh, oh, cringy oh. I hated yeah that. weird <laughs> hated it yeah like, that's awkward if uh, she had licked it it would not have been more either. gross mm-hmm. <laughs> oh no. hey oh yeah all right so um well, we know that you're a fan of this film, Max, but, but what other thoughts and impressions do you have uh, after this viewing Yeah, experience? I tried for this viewing to be very critical of it because I know I've watched it so many times because I really like it as a movie. I really wanted to sit down and say, okay, so what's actually not good about it? I think the pacing isn't actually great in this movie. There's a, mm. there's a couple of things that could be shorter especially like the final scenes leading up to the exploding of parliament. I think they could have been quicker on getting to the point in those Mm. scenes. There's a lot of extra stuff. There's a lot of just watching all of the people walk to the parliament building. There's a lot of that. And also the way this movie gives you information makes it a very deeply confusing movie. There's no way you can sit down and watch this movie and get everything you need to know. Yeah, to it's like definitely make it make not sense. like a linear story. Yeah. Like there's a lot of flashbacks, a lot of like, is this, was this real? Was this yeah. a dream? I don't know. Uh, did it's, you say, is that when you said flashbacks? <laughs> flashbacks. Yeah. Well, it starts by giving you a whole bunch of information without any context. And then they give yeah. you the context to that information later. So it, you can't really pick that up over one viewing yeah. because you didn't really catch it in the first place because you didn't understand it in the and first place. And there's also a lot of old man characters that kind of all yeah. mesh together in my head too. Yeah. So and that's always a problem for me is a bunch of old white guys. I'm like, yeah. what? who are you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like yeah, V, I, I, v has a lot of great quotes in this movie as well, but he also 50% of the stuff he says is just sort of throwaway stuff. He's like quoting something, you don't really get it, move on, you know? Yeah, it, it, and sometimes it sounds like it's just word salad. Like, yeah, exactly. Like he says yeah. so many words that it just starts to wash over you. And it's like, I know what the words are, but in the sequence they're put together, it doesn't really make a statement for me. I'm yeah. like, I don't, I don't know what you're trying to say other than like his first speech, which is extremely alliterative. Yeah. I, I'd love to hear if someone can count how many V words are said in that one statement, but it's a yeah, lot. It just starts to be like, yeah. okay. Well, it felt like, like a Sesame Street. Yeah. <laughs> like we're just going to name all the V words we yeah. can come up with. And, if you, and if you do read through that speech, the grammar is not all there. Yeah. Um, it's not. It doesn't really make sense if you try it's, to yeah. dissect it. Yeah. It's fun to do as a monologue when you're in high school, which I did. But yeah, yeah, I did. I don't want to give away too much for our later section of the sh- of the show. But I liked Stephen Ray's character. I liked that there was someone who was a part of the establishment that was questioning what was happening, and yeah. like he invests most of what we learn about V's history and even about was he Evie's the history. I'm sorry, the inspector. Okay. Yeah, the the head inspector for Scotland Yard. I have thoughts on him. Yeah. We we learn like most of the backstory. We learn a along with him as the movie goes. But yeah, the pacing of it is a little strange. I I don't understand why V doesn't just go after everybody all at, not all at the same time, because you have to go get them at different locations, but why his revenge plot is drawn out so much and he takes out the lower people first and doesn't go for the top two until the very, very end of the movie, where you'd think if he really wants to create anarchy, if he really wants to destabilize things, he would start with the top two people. Or at least very, very much, I forget, what's the guy's name? The, who's in charge of the bag people? Creedy. Creedy. Yeah. Like he would at least go for Creedy first. I mean, it's it's good that he goes for the guy who's like the the, the news mouth. Guy. Yeah. Yeah. Who's the Rush Limbaugh or yeah. Tucker Carlson of that <laughs> news division that he goes after him. I think he's the first person we see get killed. Besides like the people in the... 
I think he's the, the first person who goes yeah, out the television after, like, individually. Yeah, yeah but yeah. he's the first person involved in the plot at the prison that gets killed. Yes. But if if it was me, which it is not, because I'm not going around trying to kill people. Yeah. But I would, always, I would go for that guy and then Creedy and then just go for the top. I wouldn't even waste time with the doctor. Or the priest. Yeah. Like, the, I, I, mean, the I mean, the priest, the priest was, was a bad was a, dude. A bad but, guy, yeah. but he didn't kill him right. because he was like trying but to have sex lady, with young girls. But the lady, he could have left yeah. her alone, honestly. Delia. Yeah. Or at least waited, or who knows how this plot could have gone. And and I do yeah. try when we do these movies to not review the movie that I wish it was and review the movie that it actually <laughs> yeah. is. Um, so I try yeah. not to change the plot too much. But in my head, it just it just didn't make sense that it, it took so long. When this movie first started, I was like, I don't know if this premise is strong enough to support an entire year's worth of time going by. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you, you've made me think of something interesting, Jonathan, going back to my thoughts on the actions and the, the storyline with Evie. I had completely forgotten that she tries to, like, warn the priest when I went to rewatch this. I was like, yeah, so when, when yeah. She started to say that I was in my head. I was like, wait a minute. Is this part of the plan? I thought it was like, a trick to trick him. Mm, I yeah. thought it was a trick. So that really just felt even though we hadn't known much of her at this point, that it was just still pretty early on in the film, but it still felt like out of character for her to do that. And I, you know, it, it clearly was just a setup for her to run away and go hang out with yeah. Fry for a little bit. Yeah. But uh, that just felt like really out of place for me. And again, that's all part of what you guys are saying, that part of the plot that seemed to have gotten drawn out a little bit. Yeah, that's just, I thought that was very interesting. The other thing I want to say about the the whole thing with the priest is that, A, yeah, she's now aware that he's like having underage girls brought to him to have sex. Why is she trying to save this guy? Um, I think that yeah. she's still hoping that he can maybe help her somehow, escape from that's... me. I don't, I don't, I was very confused by that too. I was like, who is she double crossing here? It took me a minute to figure out what she was doing. Yeah, she had sort of made that plan before she knew what what she was doing she was like hey do you want me to help out because she wasn't all in on v at that point in the movie she was trying to find an out so she was like let me help you and then when it turns out she should have actually helped him instead like well i've already gotten this far in the plan so i'm just gonna go for it it's yeah. not like a perfect plot thing but it is it was written out she's holding uh gordon's address stephen fry's address in her hand and on a piece of paper and one of the scenes preceding that oh that's what like, was on the piece of paper yeah that was okay. it was his name and then his address yeah, yeah. And then she gets him killed yeah, yeah that's he well he a, got himself killed oh but i think what the movie wants you to think is that he's emboldened by her and by v a little bit and that's why he does the thing with the parody of the Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. We're just gonna, I'm just going to call him Palpatine because yeah, that's pretty basically. much who he is. <laughs> no, no, no. That was weird. It took me a minute to figure out what was going on there too. With yeah, the I was like, and what was it with 2005 and Natalie Portman being in movies with evil chancellors? Ooh, that's crazy. Right. That is a thing. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's like she's typecast. All right, before we move on to the fun stuff, does anyone else have anything else to say up to this point about what it was like to watch the movie? I have questions on how he became so good at fighting just from watching Count of Monte Cristo over and over. <laughs> it's a little bit of that. Is it's, that what we're supposed uh, to his, determine? His strength and speed and like being really good and semi-invincible until he dies thing. It was sort of Is he supposed slammed to like have in there. Kind um, of superpowers? Vaguely. They like plaster in an explanation about why very quickly. It, I think it's some kind of a combination between the disease and the treatment that they were receiving uh, in the uh, detention okay. center. Yeah, he, like, um, he yeah, like yeah, developed some, like, some sort of radioactive... Like Deadpool mutation. Yeah, mm. they said thing. like yeah. increased reflexes or something, so there's that. And also, I'm pretty sure because he was burned all over his body, he can't really feel that much anyways. Like, he doesn't have that many nerve endings left. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's definitely probably the most comic booky thing. I mean, technically a graphic novel, but that's really like the only part of the plot that feels like a graphic novel to me is the fact he was able to somehow like gain powers from the experiments that they did on him, which is, you know, something that I really appreciate when I see films that are based on graphic novels. Yeah, I like my comic book movies to be like comic booky. Like I love my Avengers and Marvel films, but it's really fun to see a plot like this come from a graphic novel origin. And yeah, I, yeah. With a lot of these graphic novel type things, and you see with like Sin City, which is not an Alan Moore comic, but like Watchmen as well, is like I love seeing the detective 
kind of aspect and genre mold into it. And that's where, for me, the Finch and the other detective, uh, I really enjoyed their their storyline. And I, I almost feel like if this film had been drawn out into like mini series, it would have been cool to see a little bit more of the fun aspects of figuring out these steps from here to here and who each person is along this plot that they're uncovering. Yeah, I was going to say that I found that plot line with Stephen Ray and the guy that was helping him. And it was I was really surprised that the guy didn't betray him at all yeah. at any point. He ends yeah. up not getting doesn't get found out that he's questioning his, his loyalty and discovers this plot that he knew nothing about before. And, you know, that all the people that he works for are evil. I was glad because I was like, oh, this guy is going to turn on him. He's going to turn him in. He's going to get killed at the end. And none of that happened, which was good yeah. because it would have been more predictable. Um, but yeah, I, I would watch watch a show about these guys investigating this thing. Oh, yeah. If, well, the if, detective definitely, I, I don't think he was necessarily on anybody's side. He just really wanted to know the truth. He wanted yeah. to know what happened. He wasn't, I don't feel like he was good or bad. Like he was just doing his job, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. All right. So talk to us about the eyebrows in this okay, movie, Jennifer. Speaking of the detective, he had my favorite eyebrows. Did because he? Because I felt like he could see his own eyebrows. His <laughs> brow <laughs> protrudes so far from his face and his eyes are so sunken in that when he's looking like his face is down, but he's looking up, I'm like, can you see your own eyebrows? <laughs> and they're very <laughs> short and stumpy. And, thick. and of course, like it's a bunch of old English guys in this movie. So all their eyebrows are bad. Nobody has good eyebrows except the Guy Fox mask, I guess. But... Yeah, very drawn on. Yeah, <laughs> very drawn on. <laughs> and then, well, and of course, then there's Natalie Portman who's who's being, like, tortured and she gets her head shaved. But her hair never grows back. Does she sh keep shaving it as a choice? Because she comes back, like, months later and her hair is still shaved. Yeah. I, I don't uh, I'm not clear on the timeline from when she gets released to when... I feel like they said it was, like, in summer and then she comes back in November, right? Yeah, I, I, no I feel idea. like it's been at least a couple of months and yeah. plus we don't know how long she was in that cell like did he keep shaving her head that's the other thing was her, he also shaving yeah. her armpits because she had no armpit hair or leg hair is is that part of like the torture too like i'm gonna shave your armpits too he was giving her like a full <laughs> i mean i would think if you're just hanging out yeah. in jail you're not really concerned with your armpit hair but okay and her eyebrows always stayed on point too so i guess he was also waxing her eyebrows yeah but yeah. uh but yeah the inspector he could see his own eyebrows good job inspector yeah. good. and and you know hair of course always goes along with the eyebrow section of our show and she had such pretty hair and he she shaved did. it off yeah and i was like Ugh. again for no reason like, and then she kept teach that her a lesson natalie portman like kept that shaved look for a while well, or that's what sure. well, even in the movie I she think for a, little, for a little while she kept a short look. Oh, no. She should have very nice, she has very nice, long, pretty hair. She should keep it that way. Well, I mean, uh. I guess, too, like, there's there's a lot of things, like, I know, like, a lot of Broadway actresses keep their hair very short because they wear wigs all the time. So maybe that, maybe she wears wigs. Or, well, you know, if she's Queen Amidala, she's got a lot of headdresses on, too. Yeah, I, I, I also hot. wanted to say that, yeah, while her British accent was not the best, I was like, at least it's not her Queen Amidala accent. That was bad, too. Mm. Because yeah. that makes me want to stab myself in the but face. But again, if you want British <laughs> Natalie Portman, just, just hire, hire Kira, Kira Knightley. Knightley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but who knows what Kara was up to? She might, you know, she's like wants to be a serious actress. She doesn't want to be in like comic book movies. Uh, she's maybe. barely in the Pirates, I mean, she was the in last Pirates Bend movie. Like Beckham, I mean. But that's, uh, yeah. She was younger then. Uh, anyway, moving on. <laughs> Next segment. <laughs> yeah, which I've also never seen Bend It Like Beckham, so maybe we should Me do that. Me neither. Me neither. That seems like it might be a fun one to watch. So does this movie live up to the hype? Does it deserve its cultural or prestige status? And would you recommend this movie to someone who's never watched it or recommend a rewatch? What do you think, James? Yeah, I would I would definitely say, and I've already kind of stated this, that I do feel like this movie gets the recognition it deserves mm -hmm. in a lot of cases. I mean, obviously, I have not watched it much over the years since it was since it's been released. I've kind of caught little bits here and there, but never a full. I would have to say it was my second full sitting through it that I can remember. But I, I feel like it certainly got some great themes in it that are things that we should all think about, like I already said, mm -hmm. because it's really a great lesson in like keeping an open mind and seeking truth in the proper places. Yeah. Especially yeah. in the last couple of years, this is something that we all across the globe need to do a better job of is finding research points in the right places and finding the right resources. It's not, not to get all political or whatnot, but um, this is a political thriller. Um, yeah. So yeah. when we're talking about it, we 
we can definitely talk about how significant it is. I don't feel like it's a movie that everyone's like, oh my God, I cannot believe you haven't seen this movie. But it's definitely one that like I've heard people say like, oh yeah, it's a, it's a great movie. You should definitely give it a watch. And I would definitely say the same thing to anyone who has not seen it. So yeah, definitely give it that recognition. Mm. Yeah, I think it tells a very interesting story. It's very gripping, even though, like we said, it is weird that the plot is drawn out over such a long period of time. The plot is still very interesting. And setting this ticking clock for the blowing up of Parliament is an interesting way to start the movie. Yeah. You already know where the final action set piece is going to take place, which is not something most action movies do. It's like, okay, we, we're already set up for and waiting the whole time to see what's going to happen, you know, especially the showdown with the ar- him and the army and figuring out how he has planned to do this because the authorities the whole time are like saying, oh, it's not possible, it's not possible, it's not possible. And you know it's going to be possible, otherwise why would they make the movie? But yeah, I think it certainly in terms of graphic novel adaptations, I think this is a really good one because it doesn't try to be too comic booky. I I can't yeah. watch Sin City. The visual style is just too distracting. Yeah. I like that it's it it looks like it takes place in the real world. And the like James said, these are important things that need to be examined and people need to not listen to uh state run television and radio. <laughs> You know, you, you know, you need to uh, n- not just accept what's spoon fed to you by the government for certain. So, yeah, I think especially in terms of if you look at it through that lens, I think it is a very important movie to watch. Again, it's not a pleasant movie to watch. I'm glad that I watched it. I think it's particularly in its genre is probably one of the better adaptations that I've seen. What do you think, Jennifer? I mean, I get Totally get what you guys are saying, but it's it's not for me. It's probably not for people who like the kind of movies I like. Not a pleasant way to spend an afternoon. I totally get what you guys are saying. It's, you know, it's it's got a message it's trying to get across and all that. But uh, I don't know if I go to the movies for that personally. Mm. Yeah, Jen- and like what Jennifer's saying, it's not something that I would go around to like all my friends be like, you got to see this movie, you got to see this movie. Right. Just not, not what I would do. But if somebody came to me and was like, hey, I'm thinking about watching V for Vendetta. Is this a movie that's good? I'll be like, yes. Okay, yes, that's fair. Yeah, sure. That's a good way to put yeah. it. It's not one that I would seek out and be like, oh my God, here's my list of top 10 movies that you need to see before you die that I love. You know, it's definitely one that like, if you approach me and we're thinking about touching it or like, hey, I've never seen that movie. What's it about? Like, I would be like, oh, it's it's about this. You should definitely watch it. I won't spoil it for you because it has that added mystery to it. Um, mm-hmm. to where like, if you know everything that's going to happen, it might make it less enjoyable for you. Whereas even if it's not your style of movie, it's still fun to see things get uncovered in the way that they do. Mm. Everyone loves a good mystery. Yeah. And figuring that yeah. how I feel about it. What do you have to say, Matt? About yeah, this? Nice. I would both agree and agree to disagree. This is a movie that I would recommend to people, but like everything, I don't recommend everything to all people. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, this is not a movie yeah. that I would recommend that Jennifer go see, but it would be a movie that I would recommend Jonathan go see because I think he would find at least some things interesting in it. And also, he's supposed to like me and I like it, so he better watch it. <laughs> I don't um, have to like you, man. Yeah. You right. watch it. You're fine. Do what you want, Jennifer. Hey, I'm still Team Houseboat with you, Max. Oh, yeah, Team Let's Houseboat all day. Let's not forget Team Houseboat. Yeah, talk to us about V for Vendetta on houseboattruth.com. Um, but yeah. I would recommend you watch this movie on a houseboat <laughs> yes. while peeling an Absolutely. apple just in one big, long um, coil. <laughs> But would I recommend this movie if you're into comic book movies or you're into action movies? Yes. And also maybe sometimes no, depending on what you're actually looking for Mm. in those movies. Because this isn't actually an action movie that's that great at being an action movie or a comic book movie that's that great at being a comic book movie as we know them. It's not like very comic booky until they're in the fight scenes. And there's also not that many action scenes, not that many fight scenes. Mm. There are like maybe three of them and they're fairly short too it's very much a hybrid yeah. of a bunch of different genres sure. yeah and and it's like each yeah. you know you're following like I, w- I would say maybe four different plots at the same time yeah you're following what v is doing you're following evie's story which they sometimes intersect you're following the detectives which sometimes intersects and you're following the government and, and the flashbacks uh, there's that whole yeah. story about the movie star girl yeah there's all that. all that stuff is like each of those Plots is like almost like its own genre of film. Yeah, all mashed together. 
It's very hard for me to like place V for Vendetta as a specific thing because it's not, it's very much not a normal movie. Right. Like it's very, it's very much not any part of it is what you would expect it to be. And it doesn't really fit in with anything else. Mm. It's like not quite actiony enough to really be an action movie, but it is still very dark and brooding as well. All right, guys. Now it's time for us to move on to our favorite segment of the show. Yes. Yes. The what do you mean you've never seen awards? Woo-hoo. And so as our guest, James gets to award our first, how do you mean, what Lucky. do you mean you've never seen award? And that is, is this movie, James, Better than the Muppet movie? Oh, boy. Uh, What a tough question. I I think (laughs) about this now. Since you guys started doing the show, I've thought about this with every movie that I think about in my head. Mm -hmm. Um, As everyone should. Right? That's that's the standard. (laughs) I would say as as it goes, just plain thinking about, like, the quality of a movie. And I think I'd give give the edge to V for Vendetta as just being a better movie. But, uh, of course, I still would rather watch, if I had the choice between the two, I'd always watch the Muppet movie. I love the Muppets. You know, we all grew up in the same house together where we loved watching this movie. But I, I do think that... that well, not all of us. Is a better movie. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, uh, Max didn't grow up with us. Well... No, I know. That's no. what I mean. But, you know, you, sorry, sorry, Max. But, like, we, we all love <laughs> that movie and the hilarious story that goes behind asking this question in the first place. But I don't think that the Muppet movie is a better movie than this movie. I think this is a better film overall. Shocking. That is is a hot take. A hot take. Hot take. take. I gotta say, we're eventually gonna have to like make a tally of how many of how many movies are better than the Muppet movie and how many So far, are it's, not. it's not many. Mo- Muppet movie beats most movies. Yeah. You know, I got to yeah. say. <laughs> it deserves yeah. its reputation. <laughs> All right. Uh, does anyone else have any strong thoughts on the Muppet movie question? Well, again, better songs. It's just, you know, they're just better. Yeah, the songs yeah. in this movie are very slow and they're all it's old. It's like there's, yes. either, there's the 1812 overture or whatever yeah. it's called. Yes. There's that and then there's a bunch of weird standards that he dances to or wants to dance to. Mm-hmm. Which, again, well, going back to the cringy, I know Kissing the Mask was cringy, but for me the dancing was also very, very cringy. Super, Didn't love the dancing. Yeah. Didn't love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, better songs, Muppet movie. I and mean, also, how, how are you going to have... beat Dr. T and the Electric Mayhem? You're I mean, not. if you had busted them. out with the Muppet Show theme instead of the 1812 overture, I would have stood up and applauded this movie for I the rest of my life. I would have lost my mind. 100%. I would the watch 18, that over the and 1812 over. overture is like super cliche to play along with explosions. It's I mean, a little, on. there's already explosions in the song. Right. And yeah. yes, no. it's a glorious three-hour finale. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have ten minutes. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, the, our next award we're going to give, I'm going to ask Max, because Max is the one who's seen this movie the most. Yes. Name something you like better than this movie, and name one thing that you like less. Hmm. I like Eggy in the Basket better than this movie. I would rather just eat a nice egg in the middle of a slice of bread. It looked really good, but she said she was starving, and this man gives her one, one piece, piece of, of toast, toast and one <laughs> egg. That I mean, I know she's tiny, but like, can she she's, at least have an additional piece of? She toast is now? tiny and fake British. That is enough for her. Yeah, I that was not British. Like, why didn't he give her like a full British breakfast? You know, like beans, beans or whatever. Yeah. Flat bacon. <laughs> but that also, yeah. that, cold, that also cold rolls. Nature. Yeah. I will say when I was in brought up an interesting thing because they she says, Oh, real butter? I'm like what what is going on in this future where they can't even have butter? Yeah, like, they're like rationing weird things. That is a too. future I don't want to live in. I right? exactly. Say. Yeah. You know, I and no way. For those of you who knew Jennifer and I in our younger years, we grew up in a household that only had country crock margarine in it. Mm. And I will never do yeah. a com- if country crock Crock <laughs> paid me a million dollars. I would never do an ad for them on this podcast because that stuff is disgusting. And <laughs> uh, shout sorry, out sorry. Land of Lakes. We'd love a sponsor. Yeah. Just yeah. <laughs> if butter, like Real if butter. Big Butter wants to pay for this yeah. podcast, I will take your free samples. Uh, I will sell butter all day long, yeah. every day of my life. But yeah, country crock margarine and margarine, which let me remind you, scientifically is a is a chemical composite that even flies won't eat. Mm. Yup, it's basically plastic. It's mm. pretty much just spreadable plastic. Yeah, yeah so yeah, yep. as, uh, that that t- that hurt me very deeply. That there was a, a world where like, oh my god, real butter is like a luxury. No, 
real butter is a necessity. Yeah, that was that was hard. <laughs> I um, need butter more than I need when like I, water. When I was in England, I'm going to shout out my friend Shauna who lives in England, and she made me the best breakfast. She gave me this like sausage, that kind of like this like appley sausage. It was or it had like onions in it. Oh, it was delicious. It was so good. And she's a vegetarian, but she still cooked me sausage. So shouts out to Shauna. That looked like a way better breakfast than just one piece of one toast. One piece of toast. <laughs> Yeah. One little piece of toast for you, you small, fake British woman. All right. Uh, <laughs> next. Okay. Then this is a question that everyone gets to answer. Mm. Uh, James, you're going to get to go first because you're the guest. Who's the winner of this movie and who is the loser of this movie? Oh, I would definitely say that the winner of this movie is Finch, the inspector. For me, he's got he's got to be the winner. As much as I I love V as a character and he's such a badass in the way that he fights and everything and that you know he did complete his mission of finding revenge on people that did evil things to him very very much akin to the kind of monte cristo which is also a great story many different film versions of it but anyway uh, i think finch because like like what we've already discussed here is that he he really was just trying to do his job and find the truth Mm -hmm. and you know Mm -hmm. he's kind of caught in the middle of like wanting to expose the truth to this government but he's he ultimately works as a very higher up position in this government and Mm -hmm. you know he's getting yelled at by the chancellor on this ginormous 1984 screen and but he still is like just out there doing his job so yeah definitely the the kind of the kind of cop that i i want to i want to back him uh in what he does so i would love like like we said it would be fun to see a spinoff with him and the other detective Mm -hmm. and and who's the loser uh the loser for me has got to be natalie portman with her fake british accent that's that's all I gotta get. Yeah. And the fact that she kept shaving her head after she was yeah. like free from the. Prison. I I, 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 I like Natalie Portman. I, I like her as an actress. I think she's. I think she does very well in a lot of the roles that I've seen her in, minus uh, Attack of the Clones. You know, but that's save that for another. Sorry, I can go all, all day about that, but it felt like a miscast for me. For, the, for this role. Mm. Yeah. And what do you, th- what do you say, uh, Jennifer? I think the winner of this movie was Valerie. I really liked her story. I wish we'd seen more of her. I wish she had had a better fate. It made me sad that I was like looking forward to Natalie Portman getting back to reading her story. I thought, I thought that was really interesting. I think the loser was that weird little girl with the glasses. I, oh, she I, got shot in the she head. She got yeah. shot. And yeah, she uh, died. Yeah, she yeah. was like painting V and then, but then she did come back at the end. Uh, that but confused. everybody, that everybody was everyone. Everybody came back at the end. Yeah, yeah. I didn't like that little girl, but. Second second loser would be the priest. He he sucked. Hated him. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, how about uh, you, Max? Valerie Valerie was there at the end too. Basically everybody in the movie was there uh, at yes. the end. Yeah, and um, her girlfriend was yeah. there with her. Mm-hmm. Her girlfriend, what's her face? Yeah, what's her um, face? She was my favorite character. Yeah, what's her face? I think what's what's her face won the movie for me because, uh, no. You know, I don't really know. I don't think this is a movie where anybody particularly wins. Mm-hmm. You know, there's not really a lot of winners in this society that they've put forth. I'd say the loser for me would be, yeah, the priest, but I don't know if anyone's really winning this one. Mm-hmm. I mean, I agree that the the inspector deserves kudos for this movie, and he's the closest thing this movie has to like a true hero because Definitely. yeah, he he risks a lot to get to the truth. You he know, doesn't really do anything do, wrong. He's and he's he doesn't have the mask to hide him like V does. He's out there. He's like face to face with this Supreme Chancellor Palpatine guy. I actually think a Stephen. Stephen Fry, Fry yeah, might I be the that. winner because I mean that was ballsy. Yeah, what he it was. did. Like, and he, he wasn't being sneaky about it. He didn't have to like hide what he was, he didn't hide what he was doing like the other Steven did. And you know what? Good for him. Yeah. He like, he, he got, cool. and he got him. that on the air. And uh, I also read a little trivia for this movie is that Stephen Fry really enjoyed this role because it's the first time he's ever like gotten beaten up in a movie. <laughs> Mm. Interesting. Because usually he's yeah. just in like these drawing room dramas where you talk, you know, like hold pocket watches and sip tea and all that stuff. So this was a very different role for him. Mm. I, I liked that he he was bold and he was he was unashamed of who he was. He did have to hide it because of government doesn't allow homosexuals. It doesn't allow other religions, all this. But he had like a piece of everything in his house. And he takes Natalie Portman in and he's like, yeah, you know what? If they find you here. Oh, well. Yeah. He knows what's right and he and he knows that the government is wrong and he he goes out in a blaze of glory. Oh yeah, for awesome. sure. Yeah. I like mm-hmm. him too. Yeah, yeah, he's probably well, my favorite he, character. 
think about what he did before they killed him is like the first thing he did is run into the room to tell her to hide so it's like that was just the he only was still thing trying to mind. protect he her yeah. Yeah. yeah he was trying to protect her instead of protecting himself yeah so mm-hmm. for me he's the winner you know he de- he deserves okay, yeah. he deserved better than he got but he he still wins because i mean he's a badass mm-hmm. the loser yeah i gotta say john hurt because he died on his knees like a little Bitch. Yeah, and that boy, is did I enjoy that! <laughs> yeah. uh, all this time, he's like yelling at these people, and from behind, the screen, and they yeah. shoot him right in the forehead. Well, and I, these people I betrayed him. him. They brought him to V. I mean, brought him really? to V, and then, but then they still killed him. V didn't kill him. Uh. Uh, I liked, I loved that. I love that he got his comeuppance. I love that oh, yeah, he died sure. on his knees in terror, crying. And he mm-hmm. had such yellow teeth. He deserved to die. He was just those teeth. Alone is that's a death yeah. sentence, right? Yeah, now. how he's sh- how he's shot in this movie is not like how he's physically shot, but how he's he's filmed in this movie uh, is really interesting because when you look at him, there's lots of lights in the room that he's in, but his like pupils are as big as dinner plates, and there are like weird focuses on his teeth and like how just unhuman he well, is. Well, that yeah. whole room like is that. weird, right? Because it's like yeah. totally dark, but they just have like a spotlight on their face. Like, why is the room dark? Yeah, it's, it that's one of the few actual like comic booky elements of this movie is that yeah it reminded me of the opening scene of superman which we have not done we are going to do superman on this podcast uh, uh, no spoilers jonathan I it's, haven't seen well it. this is not a spoiler I, think I've seen it. I can just tell you that there is a scene that takes place at the beginning of the movie on krypton where it's a bunch of these council members on these giant movie screens saying guilty oh yeah <laughs> Ooh, like mr it's toad so <laughs> yeah but it's like the room is entirely dark yeah it, i was like oh yeah this is just like the the council scene from from superman yeah All right, let's rate this movie. The rules of the rating of the movie is you have to pick a metric that is relevant to this film and you Mm. have to give it one out of five or however many out of five. So I'm going to let you go first, James. Well, I'm going to give this five eggs in a basket out of five eggs in a basket for me. It's a great movie. Definitely one that I, quote unquote, forced to watch it. I don't really feel like I was forced, but... You were, re- that I, I will you were re- re-indoctrinated into it. <laughs> yeah, I will, I will revisit it in the future because I, I do think it's a very well-made film. I think while it does have fault, there's no movie that's really perfect out there except for the Muppet movie for some people. <laughs> but I, I think I think it has all the elements of a really good, solid movie. I think it's well-written. For the most part, it's well-acted. Every character in it contributes to the plot of the film and keeps the storyline moving. And Hugo Weaving is a badass. I don't think I've ever seen a movie with Hugo Weaving in it that I didn't like and I I always enjoy seeing his performance so yeah five eggs in a basket out of five Max, you get to go next all right I'm going to give this movie five out of five dominoes um yeah i thought about that too yeah (laughs) domino sequence was a cool sequence at least i think so yeah this i mean obviously i'm biased because this is a movie that i very much identify with and i get that it's not a movie that i would say like everyone absolutely needs to watch this but i think most people should watch this movie at some point in their lives. I think it's important. It's important to me, at least. So I'll, I'll give it five out of five. All right, Jennifer, you're up. All right, before I give my score, I just want to read one of my notes <laughs> about Natalie Portman. And uh, what I wrote was, she does a lot of hyperventilacting. Yeah. <laughs> Yo. So you're welcome for that term that yeah, I coined. They tell you, at, like, way, way into the movie, you find out that she had asthma as a kid, and it's apparently uh, resurfaced. By that point, yeah. it's like, okay, she, she's been doing this a lot. All right. Anyway, I just I uh, patted myself on the back for that one. I'm going to give this, sorry, Max, it's only going to get a three out of five toilet paper roll scroll autobiographies for me. Um, it's just it's just not for me. I get everything you guys are saying. I think obviously the quality, if you're talking about like the quality of film as far as acting, directing, action, all that goes, it's obviously good. But it's just it's just not for me. It's just not something I really loved to watch there was parts i i didn't really understand and yeah. it just you know just wasn't a lot of fun and and i like a good romp and this was not yeah that's that. fair there was no romping there was no seen. romping, no romping to be had. <laughs> well i will not hold it against you i mean you still rated it higher than some movies we've done that are more for you so there you go i think sleepless in seattle got a 2.5 i only got a 2.5 for that one yeah and i, and I think it, and, with that one. and i think you enjoyed that experience more <laughs> Um, so, we were a little punchy you know that what? day. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you, you know, like, I, I'll take it. I'll take it. 
All right. I'm going to give this movie 3.5 out of 5 truncheons. Those weapons that he had. Yeah. Because those are cool. Was... Those are cool weapons. <laughs> they are cool weapons. Um, because, yes, it was an interesting story. There was some exciting action in it. There was a lot of pyrotechnics. But he does kidnap Natalie Portman and keep her prisoner in his house for a long time. Had a lot of issues yeah. with that. Yeah, that's th that keeps this from being like a more enjoyable experience for me. I uh, like mm -hmm. again not to, not to like review the movie I wish it had been, but if it had been that she had actually been captured by the police and he came and rescued her, I would definitely have given this movie at least four and a half out of five. It's yeah. very problematic what it happens is. to her in this movie. And it's not like it was a day. It was, it was you a have time. to under, you yeah. have to like assume this was weeks at least. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. For that, you know, the truncheons, he's gonna get three and, three and a half out of five for me. Okay. That's the end of the What Do You Mean You've Never Seen Awards. And uh, now we're gonna talk about our final thoughts and feelings about the movie. As we have throughout this entire episode, we're gonna let our guest go first. So if you have any other thoughts or feelings or, or notes that you wanted to bring up or any of your classic James Alexander observations. <laughs> hot takes. Hot takes from hot James. Takes, my hot takes. Uh, now is the time no, to I, share. Yeah, I feel like I've said it all, really. I, I, I really enjoyed watching this film. It's on HBO Max for anybody else that wants to watch it. Uh, that's how I watched it at home. I think even if you can't watch it all in one sitting and you just need to split it up over a few days like I did, it's still it's solid. It's a solid watch. Again, like I, I've kind of already given my two cents. I think this is a, is, is a really fun movie for me. And I, like I've said several times already, it's very culturally important to the times that we're in now. <laughs> I don't foresee us ever seeing a major country being overtaken by a fascist government. So I think we all learned our lesson in that in that sense and but it's still it's kind of scary to think that these kinds of things can happen in, in other developed countries so mm -hmm. uh, and apparently i guess the u.s was in some horrible civil war while yeah, this was all going like, on because they do they do exist. briefly mention they yeah they briefly mentioned some horrible things going on in the midwest which made me kind of scared because i live in the midwest but mm -hmm. um it was it was really uh, that the entire movie i was thinking wow if it's this bad in the uk how bad is it in the States? And then they answered my question. It's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. But ultimately, like I said, it's definitely a film that I will probably revisit in the future. Uh, like, like Max also said, it's not one that I would recommend to every single person that I know. I would only recommend it to people I know would enjoy that enjoy this genre of film or mix of genres because mm -hmm. it does have multiples in it. Yes. And uh, what about you, Jennifer? What are your thoughts? Um, it's so funny you say that, James, about like the UK versus the US, because um, uh, I just recently went and saw Paul McCartney in concert, which was amazing. 100% recommend. Five out of five. It was funny because he told a story about um, how he wrote the song Blackbird, and he wrote it about civil rights because he's he was talking about how him and you know the other Beatles were watching like these things unfold on TV and specifically a story about two girls going to a university in Little Rock and how they were just getting like pummeled with you know people throwing things at them and protesters etc and Paul's Paul's thought on this was you know, we were just really surprised because we thought the U.S. was better than that. And that was that was a very sad statement yeah. <laughs> um, we're coming from a Brit. But that that movie definitely made me think of that. So that was that was kind of a, a sad state of affairs. But um, shout out to Paul McCartney. If you're listening, we'd love a sponsor. Uh, <laughs> so, um, if you want to come on and talk about a movie that you've been in. We 100%. Have to discuss it with you. Um, so anyway, so that that's funny that you say that because that totally made me think of that. But yeah, I mean, I, I get everything you guys are saying. It's it wasn't the funnest time I've had on this podcast watching a movie. I'll just Fair. leave it at that. All right, Max. Yeah, I don't know if I have many final thoughts on this movie. I just really enjoyed this movie, and that's pretty much it. Just another fun fact is for that domino scene that was done practically, and it took four professional domino artists 200 hours to create that effect. That's mm. really cool. You know, I was just, yeah. there's a show called Domino Masters. It's on Hulu. Yeah. You guys should check it out if you like dominoes, because that was pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah, that was done practically and it was pretty cool. Mm. Yeah, I think like the rest of you have said, I think most of my thoughts about the film have already been shared, so I don't want to repeat myself. But I do want to say that this is definitely a prophetic 
story. And I, I do think it is possible for it to happen anywhere. Yeah. You know, um, it's it's sad that that's possible. But as we've seen, like, you know, with all the stuff with Brexit and, you know, everything that's been going on here and, and how polarized we are, yeah. it's polarized people are easy to manipulate. If you're all your 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 thought system is like, oh, I'm just against this and against this and against this and against this. It's very easy for you to be manipulated mm-hmm. by media and the government. So, you know, we are not like we're not conspiracy theorists. We don't we don't yeah. subscribe to any of that that nonsense. And it is all nonsense. But uh, we want to encourage just con- continue to encourage everyone and ourselves to really be thoughtful and compassionate and and not let hate speech become acceptable. And yeah, that's, 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 I think exactly. the saddest thing about this, the story, and one of the sadder things about the story in this movie is that it, it does show you that eventually you can get rid of enough people that the ones that are left are okay with hate speech. And, and that's, that's an unpleasant thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very prescient that this movie is set in the late 2020s mm-hmm. and it's, there's some aspects of it that aren't like terribly far off. Even the technology in this movie doesn't seem terribly outdated. It does seem very. I noticed that too, because, yeah. you know, I'm always pointing that out in some of these movies that take place in the future and I'm like but why do yeah. their cell phones suck why do their computers suck but this one like seemed pretty spot it on it does I mean all of the TVs are like specifically JVC TVs which you don't really see anymore but like <laughs> other than that and like the computers are Dell computers which I mean they're still around but in like a, in a world but, where yeah. Dell computers continued to be <laughs> successful it's, this is the result yeah. dude you're getting sell. it's really interesting that they didn't really try to advance technology too much for this film set in the future but you know, it still works. It's, and it kind still, of it's make, not out of date it, yet. It kind of makes sense because the more the more people have access to technology, the more different ideas have an opportunity to circulate. So it would make sense that this authoritarian government would have limited people's access to things like cell phones and personal computers. Like as we've seen. Well, yeah. Butter. butter. <laughs> I didn't even have How real butter. Dare they? I would like, I will give you my computer if I can start getting butter back. You know? yeah. <laughs> give me butter or give me death. Give me butter or give me death. Justice for butter. Justice for, yeah. Do not buy country cock margarine. Do not make your children <laughs> eat that. It is disgusting. And that's all I have to say about margarine. I mean, I have so much more to say about margarine. What do you mean you've never seen is not sponsored by Country Croc. Country Croc, do not eat this. Oh, and do you know what else I hate? (laughs) When (laughs) people like use up all their Country Croc and then they wash out the container and then put other stuff in it. That's so So gross. So gross. Like I've seen people put like mashed potatoes. Like, (gasps) no, thank you. Or or mac and cheese. And I love mashed potatoes. Don't do that to mashed potatoes. (laughs) They didn't do anything to you. (laughs) Come on, people. (laughs) <laughs> show some dis- show some respect to mashed potatoes and put real butter in them too. Yeah. Do not put margarine in mashed potatoes. All right. Uh, so yeah, that, that's the hot take of the week for me. Sure. Um, um, fight fascism and country crock. Yes. Fake butter. In my opinion, country crock and fascism are the same thing. Oh, they go okay. hand in hand wow. as they did in this movie. Hot oh, that's take. true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you don't have freedom, you don't have butter. That's the, and if you don't have butter, you don't have freedom. <laughs> if you don't have I'm, I'm really g- glad that that was the part of this that resonated with you because I had a feeling that that would specifically resonate with you going in. For, the, for those of you listening at home, I did just oh make Jennifer God. choke. She was so oh, God, that was great. Oh. Yeah, yeah we, right. we're just going to do a whole episode about butter pretty soon, I think. Oh, my God. All right, so thank you all for your thoughts and feelings about this movie. We're going to go ahead and uh, say farewell to our guest host for the week. Uh, James, we, we'd like, if there's anything you'd like to plug or, in, or any contact information you want to give to our listeners, where can they find you? If you want them to find you, what do you want them to find? <laughs> Tell us your address, please. Yeah. Do you want them yeah. to send you care packages of butter? I mean, I know you live in Wisconsin. There's probably a lot of butter there, but, you know, maybe you want some yeah. fancier butter. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, tell us whatever no, you want. What, what you want our listeners to know about you? No, um, well, you can find me on Instagram if you look for at Pleasant View Designs. I specialize in doing a lot of fan art, photo editing type stuff, like just anything you would think a graphic designer would do. So I do that. If you want to follow me, and I do commissions. So if you need illustrations, like I did for the cover art of this podcast, which we um, love, which by did. the way, oh, amazing, yeah. so good, um, we love it. I do. I, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. So if if you like to see. More 
more of that kind of stuff, you can check out my Instagram, follow me, send me a message if you like the stuff that I do and want to see more, if you have ideas for things. I always I always love when people send me ideas for fun art that is related to all things fandom, comics, movies, things like that. So Disney you can find stuff. me there at, at Pleasant View Design. Disney, a lot of Disney stuff that I do. He makes um, such you know, cool stickers, you guys. Like, I have my my water bottle decorated with, like, so many stickers. Not this one in front of me. Yeah. Jonathan's looking at me like I'm crazy. But my other <laughs> water bottle that's at home, I have decorated with all my stickers that, that uh, James has made for me. They're so fun. He He's such a good artist. You guys yeah. should really check yeah. him out. Yeah. And I, I can yeah. second that statement because Jennifer is famous for leaving her water bottles over here when she comes to visit. <laughs> so I have gonna, seen I'm those stickers, and they are good stickers. I'm going to one here because I need one for the podcast anyway. I'm going to bring one specifically for your house. That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And James can make us some, what do you mean you've never seen stickers? I can't yeah. wait. Yeah. That sounds good. So, yeah. yeah. So check the description below for links to James's Instagram and his Facebook page. Yes. Instagram is the place to find me. All that's right. That's where I'm most active. We'll leave it All at right. that. That's where you can All get right. them yeah. get them get them stickers. But thank you so much, James. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us tonight. We Hope love you, enjoy. James. We, yeah, we love oh, our little yeah. brother. He's yeah. our baby brother, by the way. Jonathan's the oldest. I'm in the middle, and then James is the baby. In case you guys were wondering. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> It was it was just really fun getting to to talk about this movie and to you know actually watch it. I spend I, I have a two year old, so I spend most of my days watching Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. So it's nice to oh watch Lord. like a grown up movie for once. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely a grown up yeah. movie, not Absolutely. appropriate for children. <laughs> no, um, definitely but yeah, not. Thank you so much, and and we hope you're going to be uh, back with us for another episode soon. Thank you so much for talking to us, and and we appreciate your input. And thank you a million times for our cool cover art and for doing the episode specific ones which i think are super cute they are really cute they're super cute yeah i love it love you brother and uh we're gonna talk to you soon thank you jay for james thank you jay for james James. (laughs) you're welcome bye guys Bye. bye all right folks and now we are going to tease our next episode are you ready? I'm so ready. I you forgot ready? what it is, yeah, so same. I'm very I excited totally to hear this. Ready to give, us, <laughs> give me my drum roll, because I hope I remember accurately, and I think I do. Our next film is going to be Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle. Oh my gosh, Ooh. how did I forget? Okay. A movie that Max and myself have never seen before. Isn't that true? But I have! You guys, this, this is, is my first one. Are you proud of me? I've seen a movie. Yes. I can't believe it. There, are, there is a movie <laughs> other than the Muppet movie, and you've got mail that Jennifer and look has at their seen. Those are the, the only own. movies I ever talk about on this podcast. Yes, so I have seen this movie before. I actually really love it. I think you guys are going to like it. It's a really fun romp. As I said, I love a good romp. What do you guys think about this movie? What do you, what do you think you're like? <sighs> what do you think it's about? I literally have no information about it. You've seen like the original yeah. Robin Williams. Yeah, I've, I've Jumanji. seen the, the, yeah. the. I'm a big fan of the original Robin Williams Jumanji movie. It's. I know who's in it. Like, it's The Rock, the Rock and mm-hmm. Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart, Karen Gillan, who we, those of you who are Marvel fans will know her as. Uh, who does she play? <laughs> I don't remember. I, I literally only know her from this. So if she's in yeah. Marvel, that's from Guardians nice to of the me. Galaxy. She's, oh, she's in Guardians oh, of the Galaxy. Okay, okay. Um, Gamora, maybe? Not Gamora. Um, Nebula. Nebula. She yeah. plays Nebula. Very, had a big role in uh, Avengers Endgame, which is a Marvel oh, movie that Jennifer that. has seen. <laughs> see that actually but she I, is but the I blue feel one. like she has a bigger role in this movie so that's probably why I know her uh, more in this um yeah. and Jack Black Jack, Jack Black, Black yeah. not, who hasn't been doing much acting lately so and I know this movie came out a few years ago I feel like this was maybe around 2016 ish maybe yeah sounds about right 2016 or 2017 yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, yeah, and I, I know that it's, rather than being a board game, I know that it's now a video game. Interesting to see yeah. how that shakes out. And instead of, because I know Robin Williams gets sucked into the game in the first movie, right. but we don't actually see any of that. Right. But it looks like this movie is, they get sucked into the game and we're like following the in game that. in the movie instead mm-hmm. of, yeah. versus the first movie, which is Jumanji comes to the real world. It's yeah. the real world that goes to Jumanji, which I think is an interesting premise. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what we think. Yeah. Um, so the reason why we're doing this movie right now, we're very excited about this, is we have a guest coming on that was in 
this movie, you guys. <gasps> into the movie? He was in the movie. But it's, it's not Jack it's Black. It's not Jack Black. It's not The Rock. It's not Kevin Hart. But this person is a professional stuntman. He was in this movie. He's been in a lot of movies. He was um, Chris Pratt's stunt double in a bunch of movies. We're so excited to talk to him. We can't wait. He's going to be a really awesome guest. It is going to be a little bit different from our usual format because we're actually going to more focus on the interview. So we won't talk about the movie like as much as we normally do. We'll probably just do, you know, maybe our, our awards and a quick little summer summary of it and what we think. Mostly we're going to be focusing on the interview with, um, his name is Tony McFarr. Um, he's a really cool guy. He's local here in Orlando. I actually knew him from before he was a stuntman in movies and, uh, he was in this movie. So we're really excited to talk to him. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. he'll have some, some interesting tidbits to share with us. I can't We wait. are, we are mm-hmm. going to watch the movie before we do the interview. So all three of us will be able to talk to him about his experience in the movie without being like, Oh, I don't know. I've never seen it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So normally when we have a guest on, we're, we're trying to have guests that also haven't seen this movie, but obviously he was in the movie so yeah, <laughs> that's so going to be a little he's, different for yeah, us yeah he, he's we're going to do it's going to be a two part episode it all be on one recording but we're going to do the review of the movie and then at the end we're going to have our interview with him and uh, we hope it's going to be a fun and exciting new content for you doing doing the episode in a different way yeah yeah and uh, give you something different to experience a, a wholly different experience than watching this movie i'm sure oh yeah <laughs> really? the one that we just watched yeah all right it's, so it's going to be well again we do we do like to shift things around for you guys you know we like to go from maybe a serious one to a more fun one and I feel like this one is going to be a fun one for us. So I'm, I'm real excited about it. All right. Now it's time for us to say goodbye to you listeners. We, we to really, all our company. To all our company. M-I-C-K-E-Y. M. How do you <laughs> Sorry, I, just got a, I started spelling mouse and I just got an intense glare from Mickey. Jonathan. <laughs> Yeah, if, if, if this movie had had Mickey Mouse instead of V as its main character, I think I might have liked it even more. Huh? Huh? Okay, for Kermit. Huh? Love it, baby. Huh? What if it was Kermit instead of V? What if they redid what if this they movie? What if they took the mask off and it was Kermit? It's that would so... be amazing. I would wow. watch that. It's not easy being V. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah, Muppets, so, so yeah, um, tune um, in for Jumanji. Welcome to the jungle. It's going to be so good. I'm excited. All right. Well, thank you all so much for listening. Thank you for liking and subscribing and for downloading our episodes. Thank you for going to our YouTube channel and liking and subscribing there as well. We really want to grow that channel. We may even start putting some fun little tidbits for you up on that that don't even go to the regular podcast Ooh. websites. So yeah, we wanted you guys to engage with us, send us an email. You know, what do you mean you've never seen at gmail.com is our email address. If you have suggestions, if you have additional thoughts on the movie, Welcome to the Jungle is available on Stars. If you have the Stars app or if you have the Stars add on for Hulu or Amazon Prime, we, I think, are going to have to do, we're going to do the Stars add on to Amazon Prime because you can rent it on Amazon Prime for $3.99, but, you know, with us having to see so many movies now and the fact that Sony does not have its own streaming service still, which I don't understand why that's not the case. Uh, or why Shout that's out the case. Sony. Yeah, Sony, come on, catch up. <laughs> yeah, hit us Sony up. Plus. Tell us why you're not Sony doing that. Sony Plus, <laughs> yeah. Hit us up on Twitter, Sony, and tell us why you don't have a streaming <laughs> service. We want to thank you again, and we appreciate all of the engagement that we've gotten, and we are so happy that we have fans and that they li- like our show and that they listen to us. Yeah, and thank you again yes. to James for coming on and talking to yes. us. We love our little baby brother. He's yes. so great. Please check out his Instagram. He's, yes. He's very good, and I'm not just saying that because I'm a sister. Yeah, because if he was bad, she would tell you. Trust me. Oh, I 100%. am her brother. I'm very critical, so. <laughs> <laughs> and we're way meaner to our own family family than we are to other people. But he is very talented and very good and we're very proud of him. Yes. And so I'm going to pass it off to my co-host to say farewell for this week. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, Goodbye. Have a great day. Bye everybody. Farewell. Have a good time at home or in the car or wherever. Okay. Goodbye everybody. (laughs) On the treadmill. In the bathtub like how I listen to podcasts. Folks, I don't know what that was that just happened. (laughs) We'll cut but, it out. <laughs> Don't worry. No, we're going to keep it in. <laughs> yeah. No, I must live with myself, it's and in. I'm happy about it. It's in. I am glad. It is, that, that is going down in history. It's going to go on, on our, our greatest clips reel when we do one. All right. And thank you guys again. Love your engagement. Love having you as listeners. Hope you continue to listen. 
want to hear from you and uh, have a great week. We'll see you next episode. See you next Bye. episode. What Do You Mean You've Never Seen is written by John Finkelman. Theme song and editing by Maxwell Abelman. Cover art by James Alexander. Your hosts are Jonathan Colon, Jennifer Branch, and Max Abelman. Please visit what do you mean you've never seen .com for more great episodes and links to our social media and Patreon pages. Don't forget to like, subscribe, rate, and review. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you at the movies.